Welcome to the Insider at Heritage Museums and Gardens, where every other week we chat with guests and museum staff about all the exciting things that are happening in season here at the museum. This year, the museum is celebrating its 50th anniversary, so please plan to join us. My name is Judith Getz, and I'm happy to be your host today. In this episode, we're speaking to Jennifer Madden, the Director of Collections and Exhibitions. Today, we'll be talking about From Carriage to Classic, How Automobiles Transformed America. Fascinating. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so um, we've done this, uh, we did this last year. We kind of took a uh, tour of the round barn. Is this actually called the round barn? I have, uh, I mean, there are many names that are kind of associated with this building. Yes, it is a reproduction of an 1820s round stone barn uh, currently at the Hancock Shaker Village out in western Massachusetts. So people certainly do call it the Round Barn or the J.K. Lilly the Third Antique Automobile Museum. So there are a lot of things going on. And I noticed that as you first walk into this exhibit, you're confronted with why a Shaker Round Barn, which is a great question for us. Right. Why did Mr. Lilly choose to reproduce this particular building when he was looking for a automobile museum? He had formed a collection at that point and decided he wanted to open a museum but when he was you know meeting with the architect the questions coming up we're building a brand new building a brand new museum how are we going to choose the style for these buildings his architect was an expert in historic new england architecture so i think that's probably how they got started on their conversations when they had the meeting scheduled to talk about what the auto museum would look like they both showed up at the meeting with the same book marked to the same page, which was Eric Sloan's A Book of Barns, and they had that original Shaker Round Barn marked. Well, so it was say, sort of, it was meant to be. It was meant to be, absolutely. And, and in the exhibit itself, you can take a look at that actual book and the page that's open to it. Yes, yeah. So um, we walk in, and we are, you know, our, our, these are our cars, aren't they? Yes, they are. <laughs> yes, a change from last year when we had the Indy 500 exhibit, and half our cars went to off-site storage. This year we have all our cars back again. And one thing I do want to point out, which is something you aptly pointed out, is uh, we get ready for exhibits throughout the year. One of the things you had pointed out is this is the first time, I think, that we've ever had them in order. As far as I can determine, yes, I've worked here for 26 years now in June, and I was sort of surprised when I thought of it, and I went back and looked at photos of auto museum, auto exhibits here in the past, and I can't see that we ever laid out the cars in chronological order, which is something our visitors ask us for. It's completely obvious, so this was the perfect year to give the people what they want. And as you kind of take a, a primary glance around, you saw, well, you see a huge distinction between, say, car A all the way going around to car B. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a large difference. So um, we'll start over here uh, to the right, and uh, it looks like we've got a, a carriage, basically. Right. We've actually had visitors argue with us about this car. This is an automobile, an 1899 Winton Motor Carriage. Mm -hmm. But some visitors have come in and told our staff, oh, no, 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 this is a horse-drawn buggy. You don't know what you're talking about. No, this is actually a car, um, but it looks very much like a horse-drawn buggy. Its size, its body type, its high wheels, the engine is in the back. Oh, it is? Yes. I was wondering where that was. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it looks very much like a horse-drawn vehicle. And one thing that uh, I should point out, because it's kind of a point of fascination as you look at some of the other cars, the wheels are original. Here, the, this is the only car in our collection that has the original tires. Mm -hmm. Yes. So a lot going into this particular um, piece, I should yes. say. Yeah. And uh, as you look at it, make sure to pay attention to the interesting steering that is available for this particular right. piece. <laughs> a lot of early automobiles had tiller steering, mm -hmm. and this is one of those examples, rather than a steering wheel. And it's up in the front part of the carriage where you would see a steering wheel today. Exactly. Yep. So as we move along, uh, we hit uh, the 1909 white steam car Model M, which is... Uh, one of the more interesting pieces as uh, far as history is concerned, I learned a little bit about this uh, several years ago, and uh, it goes all the way back to the days of President Taft, correct? Right, yes. When President Taft was inaugurated in March of 1909, one of the first things he did 
was order four automobiles for the White House. Before this point, uh, presidents had only been officially transported by horse and carriage. Mm -hmm. So this was a big departure at the time. So he ordered a Pierce Arrow, two Pierce Arrows, a Baker Electric, and this white steam car. What is special about a steam car? For those that might not know that there are variations in motor types. <laughs> <laughs> so in the, early, in the late 1890s, when cars are just being developed, in the early 1900s, steam cars, gasoline cars, electric cars were all being made and sold to the public. And it wasn't clear at that point that gasoline would be the way that cars would, the vast majority of cars would function in the future. Kind of like the VHS and the beta? Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. So um, steam was really familiar to people at this time. They're familiar with steam locomotives. They're familiar with steam factories. Steam is reliable. It's safe. It's a known quantity. Water is available. Uh, here, the boiler is uh, powered by kerosene. Kerosene is widely available. And you can't say the same thing of gasoline at this time. Mm -hmm. So steam seemed a very logical way to power vehicles. Now, for those that are walking around, one of the things that you will notice uh, almost instantly, of course, is the National Historic Vehicle Register. It's vehicle number nine. Right. Uh, but we also have a beautiful emblem. Can right. Tell me a little bit about the history behind that. Sure. So you will see that the seal of the President of the United States is painted on the side of this car. Heritage got permission from the White House in, I think, the late 80s to apply the seal to the car. So incredibly special piece. And uh, for those that are looking again at the steering wheel, you're going to notice that it is off on the right side versus the left for this particular automobile. Right. A lot of early automobiles were driven from the right-hand side because horse-drawn vehicles are driven from the right-hand side. Road conditions at that time are not great. An improved road was considered to be a road that had most of the stumps removed. Mm -hmm. So it's a good idea if you can keep an eye on the right-hand side of the car. There's a ditch often on the right-hand side. You'd like to stay out of that ditch. Right-hand side steering made sense. As you went on in time and there are more vehicles on the road, it made sense to switch the steering to the left-hand side. As, and so at the same time, road conditions are getting better. You don't have to worry so much about staying out of that ditch. So, but you do want a good for, uh, view of oncoming traffic. <laughs> so left-hand side steering made more sense. And eventually, there wasn't a law or anything that said, we're not going to do right-hand side steering anymore. Eventually, nobody wanted it anymore. Mm -hmm. And by the early 1920s, say, all steering had moved over to the left-hand side. I remember you talking at one point about uh, passengers as well being dropped off on uh, sidewalks, and that kind of played right, a part exact, in as well. Right, Right. If you have right-hand side steering, your passenger gets out in the street and walks around the car where left-hand side steering, you can pull right up to the curb, and they could get out easily. All right. Well, yep. good point. Good mm -hmm. point. And beautiful wheels on this, too. Yes. The wooden, uh, the, I mean, I just can't imagine even wanting to take this on the road. <laughs> <laughs> but many did. Many did. Right. And as we move along, um, you see a couple of uh, the 1904 Oldsmobile, yes. uh, which is uh, kind of reminiscent of the uh, first carriage, shall we say, that we saw. Right. Tiller um, steering, very, very simple automobile, engine in the back. This is one cylinder. Um, simple car, so most people who could uh, afford this vehicle could fix it themselves. Again, this is before widespread auto mechanics and auto mm -hmm. garages. Um, this was a very, very popular car called the Curve Dash Old, or nicknamed the Curve Dash Olds. Um, and this, before Henry Ford and the Model T, this was the most widely mass-produced car, and a lot of families had an Oldsmobile as their first vehicle. Interestingly enough, when you look at what are the headlights, they're not exactly what we would envision today. <laughs> Again, all these early cars, and most of the early cars had removable lamps. Mm -hmm because if you're driving at night, you're not necessarily arriving at a place that has electricity at mm -hmm. this time period. So they were made to be removable kerosene usually, and then you could light your way to wherever you're going. Right, as we move along, this one has always been a point of terrific joy for me. It reminds me of uh, that old song with the fringe on top. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a 1910 Sears Model P Surrey. 
And that is exactly why Mr. Lilly decided to buy this car. Oh, you're kidding. Now, he was offered this car, and in the letter uh, where he replies to the seller, he says, I can't resist the Surrey with the French on <laughs> Well, there you go. Yep. <laughs> no, it really is. Uh, it, it's got a terrific character for those that uh, enjoy Broadway. It'll, it'll bring a visual to you. That's right. Um, but it is incredibly functional. And when you talked about the um, – it, it, tell me a little bit about the arrival of said vehicle to a particular you know, different right. owners. Yeah, sure. So this is a, a Sears car, as of, as in Sears and Roebuck catalog. You ordered this car from what they called the Sears Motor bu Buggy Circular. It would arrive at the nearest train station to you in a few crates. It was partially assembled, but you needed to uncrate it, finish the assembly. They included oil for you. You add your own gasoline, and then the goal is you do that right at the train station and then drive the car home. And what kind of a price tag are we talking about for a car like this? For a car like this, we are talking at that time $574. All right, so $574. Right. Wow. So in 2019 dollars, that is about 12000 it's an amazing. I mean, you know, it does not have any protection, shall we say, from elements, but it'll get you right. where you're going. Exactly. And the wide wheels are uh, very different than some of the other wheels that we've right. seen. Right. These were these cars were particularly marketed to rural customers mm -hmm. where road conditions are even worse than mm -hmm. in the cities. So it was important that the car be up high. It was important that it had solid tires as opposed to inflated tires so it could handle those difficult road conditions. Okay. And as we move along a little bit, all of a sudden you see a Cadillac up here, and boy, <laughs> what a change in the look. <laughs> Besides right. the gorgeous uh, wooden inlay and such, there's uh, you know, a fair amount of, you could say, money displayed in a car Oh here. my gosh, yes. I deliberately put these two cars, well, they fit together chronologically. They're both 1910, but I really wanted people to compare and contrast a 1910 Sears to a 1910 Cadillac. They're two completely different animals, all based on who the customer for this vehicle is. The Sears is your rural customer. The Cadillac is wealthy urban people. So your city dweller would be seen in something like exactly. this. Exactly, yes. And yep. again, still with the uh, the steering wheel over on the right-hand side. Yep. And uh, basically, it uh, looks like a family with two kids. <laughs> 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 but it does have a very unique looking horn attached to it. Is that yes, a horn? Yes, it does. Yes. Yep. That's All the right. horn. Yep. All right. So beautiful car. Yep. And we continue to move down and we've evolved into a much more extravagant look for our automobiles by this point. Right. So now we're at a 1912 Packard Victoria. So comparison to the cars we've seen, this is tall, it's long, it's really elegant with a ton of brass work on the side. This was an extremely expensive car to mm -hmm. purchase at the time. And uh, the wheels actually uh, have multi-purposes, and they hold the rear-view mirror for you as well. Yes, right. <laughs> a lot of these early cars had their rear-view mirrors mounted on the spare. Yep. All right. Well, so good tip right there. Yep. And uh, one of the things that I enjoy the most about it is the engine is actually locked down with a beautiful leather buckle. Yes. Again, a lot of these um, early cars, you'll see the hinge runs down the center to get the hood open so it sort of folds open from each side and it won't be until we get downstairs to the our 1930s cars will you see the hoods open today like our cars do today what they call an al alligator hinge okay and as we move along yeah, we see an incredibly bright yellow 1915 stutz bearcat um, incredible looking car and um, unique in so many different ways but I particularly enjoy the round vision right in front of the driver. <laughs> <laughs> right. So maybe you could explain a little bit about what's important about that Stutz. Sure. The Stutz Bearcat was one of America's early sports cars, racing cars. Mm -hmm. This is not a car that you drive your family around in and you go get groceries or anything. This was bought specifically for weekend racing, mm -hmm. essentially. So the, there is no uh, protection for the passenger in this vehicle, and the driver only gets what they call a lollipop windshield. 
very, very minimal protection. So they were wearing goggles and heavy coats and other things to protect them from flying debris. Now, one of the things I learned last year when we had the Indy 500 cars here is that in the early years, especially with the racing cars of this uh, nature, uh, today you'd assume it would just be one driver, but they had two drivers. Right. Or yes. not two drivers, a driver right. and a mechanic. And a riding mechanic, yeah. yes. These early cars were not, didn't have um, gas pumps or oil pumps. So you needed your riding mechanic to hand pump the gas and oil for you to keep the pressure up. Also, there were no rear view mirrors on these cars. So if you were actually in a race, you're, re you're re relying on your riding mechanic to turn around and look to see and tell you when it's safe to pass. And this became particularly important actually at the Indy 500 track, which was filled with some rubble. <laughs> I would assume. <laughs> yes, yes. Some of the very early races at the Indy 500 racetrack were um, deemed unsafe, and they actually had to stop some races before they were finished because the surface of the track, this is before the track was bricked, mm -hmm. um, the surface of the track was unstable and causing injuries. Now, this particular car, of course, we're celebrating our fifth. 50th anniversary here at Heritage this year. This particular car was uh, chosen by Lynn St. James, who was here last year, and talked about the Indy cars, and she found this particular vehicle to be absolutely fascinating. Right. Uh, as you said, Lynn is a race car driver, and she has driven car vintage cars in vintage car races, and so she has driven a Stutz Bearcat in the past is why she chose it. All right. We're moving along a little bit, and all of a sudden I'm seeing more room, and we're looking at a 1916 Simplex Crane Model 5. And I see room. I see actually some care given to the backseat passenger. <laughs> um, a little bit of a different, you know, what we would look at, we'd sit there and say, well, you know, I could see this in today's day and age in a roundabout way. <laughs> right, right. Again, a very large, extremely expensive luxury car. But here we have a car where, yes, you can ride your family around in here. Um, there is a uh, nice adjustable windshield for the uh, backseat passengers. This car was the first car that Mr. Lilly bought for his collection mm -hmm. in March of 1964. And uh, all of a sudden the steering wheel seems to have the changed. The steering wheel has moved to the left. Yep. As we looked at, we're talking about the same year, 1916. We're looking at a Brewster Town Landolet. 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 All right. Uh, so as I look at this, all of a sudden I'm taken to, I don't know, times like Some Like It Hot or <laughs> <laughs> some gangster type movies. But um, it's only because this type of a car has been associated with uh, some of those things in movies. But it's a beautiful car. It's got a terrific amount of leather attached to it as well. Yeah. This car was built by Brewster and Company, who had been making horse-drawn vehicles since 1810. Mm -hmm. So by the time this car's made, they've already been in business for over 100 years. When they started making auto bodies or, for different manufacturers or making the whole car themselves, which they needed to do after World War I, they just kept using the same techniques they had used to make the horse-drawn carriages. Mm -hmm. So horse-drawn carriages often had leather fenders this car, they just carried that over. This car has leather fenders as well. All right. And we take a year's departure, and all of a sudden we're seeing a little bit of a different style up here. 1917 Milburn Light Electric. What is different about this car? So we've got our first electric vehicle in the collection. This car is also completely enclosed. When most of the other cars we've seen have been open vehicles, mm -hmm. This one has a very nice, comfortable, weatherproof driving compartment. They were really, to sit in this car, as I have done many times, you feel very um, luxurious. It's like sitting in your living room mm -hmm. at home, very comfortable. You'll notice there's even a vase included for fresh flowers. Oh, yeah, and you see some curtains. That's right. Yeah, and you get some curtains for privacy. Definitely. Um, but there's no steering wheel. No. Here again, we're back to tiller steering mm -hmm. for these electric cars. So it, it is a vast departure, as uh, Jennifer mentioned, and the price tag by 1917, where are we going with an electric vehicle now? So the price for this car new was $1,885. Mm -hmm. So in 2019 dollars, that's about 37000 And I should point out that that is not what the vehicle is actually worth. Correct. In today's age. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just to buy if you were going to buy it today. Right. Okay. Yep. All right. So this covers the entire first floor. Anything else yes. that uh, you want to talk about about these older vehicles? 
that you wanted to make sure people understood as they uh, walk through this entire exhibit? I think we've covered the important stuff. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, some terrific pictures uh, adorn the walls and uh, some different uh, advertising, early marketing for cars. Right, so some of these early advertisements are just gorgeous. So it's nice to be able to blow them up on a large size for people to appreciate it. All right, terrific. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The Insider at Heritage Museums and Gardens. We've been talking to Jennifer Madden, the Director of Collections and Exhibitions. Today, we talked about from carriage to classic, how automobiles transformed America. Next week, we will continue our conversation with Jennifer about the second half of this fascinating exhibit. Today's interview has been brought to you by Arbella Insurance Foundation and Cape Cod 5, our 2019 season sponsors. You can hear more interviews like this one by finding us on iTunes. And of course, more information about Heritage Museums and Gardens and upcoming programming, that can all be found on our website at heritagemuseums.org. Until next time, thank you so much for listening.